what do you enjoy doing? What are you good at? And then what is there a need for? Welcome to Uplift and Elevate. This is our Uplift Her podcast series that shares the courageous journey of individuals getting an honest look into their life, their struggles, successes, and how they broke down barriers to get where they are today. We are Amy and Christina and believe honest conversations can help give you the elevation and empowerment to write your own success story. This is part two with Deborah Coleman. Deborah has over 25 years experience in the VFX industry. Starting as an artist, she developed her career by managing and leading large scale global teams. But more recently, she took a brave leap and set up her own business in the world of coaching. Empowering hundreds of people, Deborah has an absolute passion for leadership and helping people reach their potential. The thing we discussed is the demand for better leadership and instilling confidence in people. How do you inflict that kind of change? I think it's twofold. I think it's both the individual and the workplace. So I think um, in the workplace and even in society, we can all lift each other up. So I think it's that focus on positivity. You know, how can we help each other? I think recognizing that we are all people and we are all different individuals. So we all bring something different. We will all have different needs. Um, and of course, that's the challenge is everyone's different. So how how can you have a workplace that, that brings out the best in everyone? But I think that flexibility and leadership is key. So flexing not only to the situation, but to the people and to the team, because you've got individuals and then you've got the whole team needs as well. Um, so I think confidence and leadership is really about always having a sort of positive attitude towards everyone like let's let's give them the opportunity to thrive um let's create the environment to help them be their best to thrive um and then on an individual level working on your self-confidence and i mean working with a coach can really help with that um but there's lots of different things you can do um, to boost your self-confidence, I guess more than anything, it's your support network. So who are you surrounding yourself with? Um, are these people who lift you up or are they people who bring you down? Um, so you really want to surround yourself with people who care for you and want the best for you and are going to sort of give you, you know, that boost to your confidence so that you can take risks and try things and make mistakes and learn um knowing that you've got a good support network around you yeah i totally agree it's about teaching them that they can make mistakes Mm -hmm. and i think everyone's so kind of freaked out about making a mistake but you want to be able to work for a company where mistakes are allowed and there's no repercussions but as long as you learn from them that's fine Um, there should be that kind of support system to allow them to, to make mistakes. Yeah. I think it's got harder, hasn't it? I think with it, certainly, sorry, my specific area of expertise being visual effects. Um, I think it's got harder because the projects have become faster and faster delivery. I think there's less time and room and space for people to learn as they go. Um, but it's so important to know because otherwise you don't take risks otherwise I don't know how how do you learn and grow if you are afraid of making a single mistake we're all going to make mistakes Um, yeah so I think it's so important I think that confidence though is um what you're saying about building this network around you that goes so far though I think like thinking back Sometimes I think we're very head down, focused on the task and not necessarily always thinking about actually how we get things done is almost as important, not only for the longevity of our our careers, but also you said about leadership. You want to learn from lots of different people. You want to kind of expand that as much as possible. And that doesn't always mean going with directly the people that are in front of you and figuring out if they're different industries and different ways of doing things that actually you can learn from because you might see it 
be done in in theory but also kind of having a go and trying to find some role models that actually you can look up to and you can go actually I really liked the way that they did that I like the way that they approach it I might not do it exactly the same way but I do think we all want to see people that you can not emulate but have a look at and go actually I admire the way that they've done that the way that they've handled that situation the way that they they approach that as well it's almost like a bit of a pick and mix of leadership styles it's kind of like well I like the way they handle that but I don't Mm. know if I and then I like the way this person handles that you know so I find that I think I've always operated in that way it's like oh what can I learn from different people and how does that help me develop in my own way as well yeah it's weird though because you quite I remember uh, joining the, the industry very early on and almost being said that we're, we're very different. It's different. You wouldn't understand it. You wouldn't kind of understand the way that we operate. And that's almost the, the opposite of actually, you, I think pe- what people need is that you can learn from lots of different people and mm. you can expand what you're saying is like, have your networks, have them in a company, in the industry, but also cast your net wider than you think, because yeah. actually there's so much value that you can get from that and so much support as well. And I think yeah. that's really important for our confidence is that yeah. if you feel like you're really isolated in one company or one industry, then you're naturally almost going to, Christina, what you were saying about fear of like messing up or so you almost, almost that is exacerbated even more because then you don't feel like you have options or alternatives or exploration elsewhere yeah yeah definitely that feeling of having a choice is so Mm. important it's really empowering and if you feel stuck that's never a good feeling um but yeah I think having that wider support network really can help with that and help have perspective on yeah not just being because vfx is very niche (laughs) uh so I think it's healthy to also have that wider perspective um and I guess I just notice everyone I know who works in so many different industries everyone seems to work too hard really would like to work less hard feels yeah. under pressure um so that that uh, sadly seems to be the same across whatever whatever profession you're in yeah there's definitely similarities across all the industries so um yeah that's my uh, support system is definitely people outside of visual effects just to kind of bring things <laughs> into light for me in perspective yeah. because it's it's just easier. Um, what do you think senior leaders struggle to rethink and what is the importance of being vulnerable as a leader? Um, I think the rethinking is probably what I was saying already about um, seeing everyone as the individual that they are. So I think it's, it's a challenge because, of course, there's a job to do. There are tasks that need to be done. Um, but I, so I think the rethinking is really trying to move everybody into accepting we are all different. Um, and what how can we? Yeah. How can we create that workplace that brings out the best in everyone or gives everyone the opportunity to, you know, to do well? Um I think vulnerability is a really interesting question. I say that because I don't know how open to being vulnerable I am. And so as a coach, I fully appreciate um, the benefits of it. Um, I think, though, I've always in the workplace and even as a coach, uh, I always want to seem capable. And probably in the workplace especially when I returned to work from maternity leave I did not want to seem emotional I did not want to be seen as a mother I wanted to still be seen as the VFX compositor I was before I had children Um, so I think I've probably not been like I've yeah not allowed myself to be vulnerable Uh, I can remember going back to work after having the twins and them go start in nursery so I had a year off maternity leave and then I returned to work part-time so it's pretty ideal and I did want to return to work um but still uh that first week back at work I was crying in the toilets um because left my babies with yeah. 
people I don't know are just paying them. So it's like, it feels unnatural. Um, uh, but that I was crying in the toilet because I did not want any of my colleagues to know about that vulnerability because I wanted to seem capable and I didn't want to seem lesser because I had to. But I think as part of becoming leaders, it's really important that that is embraced and almost kind of learnt as a skill because I do think that there is and that's part of like empowering teams and you go back to the what you were saying about allowing individuals to be individuals and having empathy and compassion and stuff like that for for what people are going through and I, I totally appreciate what you're saying about returning to work after having kids I almost felt like I had to prove myself even more it was such a bizarre thing of where well, you've got to where you were in your career. You take, you, you, um, it's not a year off. It was hard work. Like it was harder work than being at work, like kind of, but you then return and now you're in this like complete like dynamic of, I have to balance a million and one things because the kids are going to, to daycare or they're doing this and you've already it com- like increased the complexity complexity like threefold um and then your kids get sick and all of this kind of stuff happens and then nursery's calling or whatever is kind of going on and you also want to try and have a career and I think demonstrating what you're saying that you're you're competent and things like that almost is discredited as soon as you look like you can't actually do a million and one things and I think that's an unfair um pedestal for all of us to be on maybe it's about picking and choosing who you do that with and where you do that I mean when I say I I think I do show I don't know I think it's partly I think it's partly comes back to the formative childhood you know first born Mm. uh I think I've always been quite strong and also wanted to be strong um so the showing vulnerability doesn't come that naturally to me having said that I've always confided in you know close friends whether they're at work or whether outside of work I think coming back to that support network again so I think maybe vulnerability is about the relationships and the space you're in so who can you be who can you show your vulnerable side to who do you feel safe to sort of confide in um I think that's quite critical I think there is a big difference though between vulnerability and like in like emotional though I think what we're not saying is you're not expecting people to necessarily kind of outwardly cry and stuff like that I think vulnerability is about like being able to demonstrate if you have done something wrong or that you are not quite sure how things are going to turn out turn out and I think that I think for people like you were saying Deborah about yourself like wanting to show that you're competent I think a lot of us particularly in this industry are built on being able to outwardly show that we're competent in terms of what we're doing Mm -hmm. and I don't know if that helps with vulnerability because actually this is an industry in itself that doesn't know what's going on half of the time. Like technology's changing, process is changing, new like kind of innovation is, and actually that vulnerability of saying, actually we don't always know how it's gonna turn out. Mm-hmm. I think it's pretty powerful than trying to outwardly say, this is what we're doing and it's all gonna be fine. I know exactly what we're doing. Mm-hmm. I think that's a scare. That's what I think people, then find difficult in leadership is that we go down this hard and fast route of not being able to share that Mm -hmm. it's not always going to turn out the way that we expect it to turn out and that's also okay yes yeah I think in yeah that's a great example actually I hadn't really thought about that as vulnerability but yeah absolutely I think I always led in that way so I think of that as a sort of inclusive leadership Mm -hmm. where you're sharing you you know there's transparency So, you know, you're still obviously um, aware of your responsibility um, and wanting to reassure and lead. Um, But I think particularly that transparency, that building of trust, that that saying, look, we don't know. It could go this way. It could go that way. It could be something we don't know yet. But let's do, you know, let's work together uh, Mm. forwards. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think taking that a step further, it's also going from the sense of we into I. So when we think of vulnerability as a, as a leader, I think what's actually quite important for leaders to show is that I don't always know mm-hmm. like the best way to do something. And I think that's where the sense of vulnerability is quite important because we're quite often happy to talk about we as a company, like this is what we have to do as a company. And I think what is empowering is when people as as leaders start to go, this is the stuff that I can know that I that I bring to the table that I add value in, but also this is some of the stuff that I, I don't always know and I'm not always that confident in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and interestingly, that was making me think about my coaching. I think maybe it's because I'm working for myself rather mm. than feeling that you're the representative of a company. Um, so I find working for myself so liberating. It's amazing. Um, and so I feel more able to, you know, as a coach, I feel more able to have that conversation with my clients about that this is not my area of expertise, um, you know, but we can, you know, we could try this together, that kind of thing. Um, so being more, yeah, vulnerable, I guess, more open about what I, what I, what I bring, what I don't bring, what I know, what I don't know, you know, that kind of thing. I think I find that easier now I'm Mm. just representing me. What are the things that you think hold women back the most? Um, What holds women back the most? I think, um, I was chatting with Amy in the break, I think it's the unequal share (laughs) of responsibilities. So typically that might be parenting, that might be caring for you know elderly relatives it might be the household you know chores the the life admin I think for a lot of a lot of different and complex reasons that burden falls on women generally speaking generally speaking women absorb or take on so much more than 50 percent of that burden I think that's what holds women back the most. Um, I, I don't know. I've always felt very strongly about this should be an equal share. Uh, I don't know if that's why I ended up divorced, but <laughs> I've always felt very strongly about that. You know, there's two, If I'm talking parenting specifically, I guess, but, you know, two parents brought these beings into the world. We're equally responsible. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's, what holds women back the most is that they still uh take on far more than 50 percent uh in most cases i mean you know some some families are great uh but i think generally speaking women really have so much more of that life admin yeah household admin um yeah yeah that's what i think yeah no i agree i think um When you start to look at things from a society perspective, I think a lot does change. I think there's some stat now that in the UK that says for women over 40, um, the the gender pay gap is three times higher than those under 40. And that's for the penalty of um, motherhood, caring responsibilities, all of those type of things, whereas actually starting on earlier in your career, is there's a much more kind of fairer if you want uh kind of set up for everybody but I think it's also there's so much that is inbuilt in society from that perspective but there's also so much that from a company standpoint as well that when you start to think about okay well if a woman has a child the company policy is normally around having like 12 months off or something around that Parental leave, um, paternity leave is still only something like two weeks for a lot of companies. And yeah. so you're still always indicating to yeah. the woman that she's the one that needs to take the time out. She's the one that, so I think it has to come from both aspects mm-hmm. of, it's not just about enhancing the woman to make sure that she can have access to stuff. It's also kind of like le- to try and level up some of the playing field is almost to shift some of that responsibility and that indication that we keep telling people over and over again through policies and the way that the system works and everything to kind of go well no actually like you as a man can kind of take that I think there was um 
somewhere that I was reading that because the, obviously the UK has had shared parental leave I think for about nine years now might have been slightly longer yeah and the, up, the uptake of that is ridiculously low yeah it's something I I, I can't remember exactly what it is but I'm sh- I'm not sure it even hit double no I don't think, I think last I heard it was single figures it's incredibly yeah low. yeah uh, you've been quite honest with us that you are a single mom. How difficult has that been whilst managing your career and setting up a business? Um, I think, um, good question. I think, um, yeah, I mean, obviously there's lots of different types of single moms. So I'm divorced and my children's dad is still part of their lives. Um, and I'm in a long-term relationship with a new partner, but we don't live together. Um, I think as a single mum, it's even more so the feeling of all the responsibility being with you. So although their dad is involved, they live with me all of the time. So they, yeah, they live with me all of the time. So when they're sick, when they're upset, when they're worried, when they have a bad night, um, when they have a doctor's appointment, a dentist appointment, all of those things, you know, sit with me, um, uh so I think it's just that at to be honest when the kids are doing well it's absolutely fine when the kids are doing well we are this wonderful unit of three um you know they're fantastic young people I couldn't be more proud of them I love their company and they're very proud of me Uh, they're very proud of me They, they appreciate that you know I'm a single mom and I work and they've always been really supportive of that and you know I think they take pride in my achievements so we're very like the three of us are kind of all there for each other um it's when it's when they're having difficulty that I think that can feel like an enormous responsibility uh probably maybe it comes back to the themes around being capable and strong and firstborn and where I think I've had to learn and needed to be reminded to reach out for help um and not just you know suffer in silence to the point of it's too much um but yeah i i think there's probably pros and cons and i i see you know i know some families who are still a family unit but they still have things are still difficult for different reasons um so i'm happy in myself And I think that's the most important thing because I'm my children see that I'm happy in myself and they see that I'm successful and we love each other. Um, But, yeah, it's that additional responsibility. And I think particularly big decisions like leaving full time paid employment in a senior role to work for myself. That's a very big decision as a single parent. You are in the process of crafting your perfect job for yourself. What advice would we give people who want to do the same? Um, Yeah, I I feel fortunate. I think I feel fortunate to have discovered coaching um, and found something that I really love doing, find very rewarding um, and and good at, and there's a need for it. So I think I think they're the key things to consider for anyone who's looking to do their own thing or just looking to be um satisfied is um what do you enjoy doing what are you good at because they might not be the same like I enjoy painting but I'm not going to be <laughs> I'm not going to make a living out of it so what do you enjoy doing what are you good at and then what is there a need for so if you if you can get an intersection of those three then you're onto a winner really so this is our quick fire round. Um, Deborah, I'm going to ask you four questions um, and we're going to ask you to kind of come up with the first thing that comes to your head. So the first one is, when was the last time you felt like an imposter? Oh, I maybe when I started the coach training. Uh, I think, yeah, the coach training and having to do that first exercise in front of people I just suddenly thought, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm this is awful. (laughs) Like my heart was racing. I was sweating. Yeah. (laughs) So I'd say that. Good. 
Great. Um, today I care less about uh, what people think about me. Great. Yeah, I think we should all care less about what people think about us. <laughs> um, if I can see into the future, I would want to know what. Ooh, that we haven't effed up the planet. Yeah, sustainability, massive, mm. yeah. Looking after mm. ourselves and the planet, a huge thing. Um, and then passing the baton, uh, we believe through Uplift Her in making like change come as a ripple. So we each influence like kind of an affect each other. So we'd like to ask you, who would you like to see as a guest on our next podcast? Oh, I know so many amazing women. Um, I think it's really important to hear from different people. Um, I think I would encourage you to reach out to Sophie Maiden. I think it might have been Sophie who invited me to connect with Uplift Her. Um, yeah, I'd say Sophie Maiden. Cool. I know Sophie, so we'll be coming after Sophie. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah, for joining us today to share your story. We appreciate it. And thanks everyone for listening to Uplift and Elevate. Our goal at Uplift Her is to develop effective and lasting change by focusing on building a strong community, providing essential career development resources, and effective mentoring programs. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, follow us on Instagram, and reach out if you're interested in getting involved and learning more about our work.